Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, everybody, for joining us today for the Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech with Adam Romano of Stephen Winter Associates. We're really excited to hear him speak about Passive House and domestic hot water. The Passive House Accelerator is a collaborative online platform for sharing innovation and thought leadership in Passive House design and construction. We publish articles and interviews. We produce weekly virtual confabs like this one. Um, and we elevate the work and programming of the Passive House movement's leaders, practitioners, and organizations through interviews, articles, social media campaigns, video, and podcasts. Our aim is to catalyze zero carbon building by accelerating the adoption of passive house building. And there's a technical technique, the technology, Sean St. Amour, Kevin Brennan, and Mark Willey. And they have, we have launched the uh, Construction Tech Tuesday together to share the technical, the technique, and the technology of passive house construction tech. Each week, we'll welcome guest practitioners to dive into the details of practice with the builder and tradesperson as our target audience. And we welcome folks from all corners of the construction and design world to join us each week. Thanks for being here. Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to say hello. Uh, I'm Sean Sanamore. And th this intro, I have to say, I have to call out the feature, you blew it. Because if you saw last week's um, event, we were at BCIT's High Performance Building Lab. If you missed it, go to the Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech page, scroll to the bottom and you'll see all of the different events that we've done. Uh, I think we're on week eight or nine, sorry, but I did blow it. And uh, my good friend, Aaron, uh, who's uh, the actual GOOT expert at 475 says that when you're talking about open face boards, that the uh, it's not just, um, you know, there's no, there actually is a, a millimeter detail to it. And so it's just the, the, the minimum width is really an inch and three eighths for what that gap to be. And technically it needs to be a, a full inch away from the facade for the open face detail. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, again, go to last week's and you know, about the 55 minute mark, you'll see someone ask me about that detail and, uh, and I'll put a link to that detail. Um, because last week I didn't give the good answer and Aaron called me out on it. And that's what I want is my friends making sure that we're providing the group with the right information. We want the right technical, the right technique and the right technology. Mark, say hello, my friend. Party on, Sean. That was great. Uh, so uh, I would like to say, first and foremost, speaking of last week, thank you to BCIT for opening up uh, your expansive airplane hangar. It was impeccable and the models were great and uh, those presenters did a darn good job too. Um, so uh, my name is Mark Willie, and I'm thrilled to be here for the technical, the technique and the technology. I'm gonna take this moment to, uh, to remind everyone to bring a friend uh, next week to thank everyone for being here this week and our topic next week will be the red door of truth and how in the world can we possibly do blower door tests on large commercial buildings? Well, Emily Rea and Lindsay Elton, they're gonna take charge and they're gonna take over. So without further ado, party on Kevin. Excellent. So <laughs> as I was uh, trying to come together with this session, I was thinking, who's the guy I know that's pretty technical and, you know, and pretty savvy and working on the future of new technology? I was like, I have a good friend I used to work with, Adam Romano, right? He was my, he was my, my Wayne. I was Garth, you know, I was saying stupid things, getting everyone in trouble. Um, uh, and I was like, Adam, we should talk about hot water. And the reason why I was like, let's talk about hot water is because we back in the office when we worked together at AEA, we would always talk about Adam has a very technical background in HVAC and gets into domestic hot water. And we would always talk about the, the frontier of after passive house is mainstream, what's the next opportunity? And we always spoke about hot water, um, uh, how we can optimize domestic hot water systems. I would go to summer camp. I would take notes at Gary Klein's uh, presentations in the upper deck there in the back at Joe's house. Uh, and I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. We're, we're gonna really optimize these hot water systems because where we came from in weatherization, 
and the International Weatherization Program, there was always opportunities to improve hot water. And we could take those lessons learned from opportunities like Passive House and then implement them in weatherization projects. So Adam's working on some uh, really cool stuff. Uh, I'm gonna just give a little bit of a background on, on uh, myself and Adam. We worked together at the Association for Energy Affordability. Uh, we were both trainers. Adam was the training director. And uh, my, my job was the hands-on air sealing installer teaching that course. And I came to Adam one day and I was like, I was just at a, a, a New York Passive House event. And this nice little Irish man was giving a presentation to Tomas O'Leary. And he asked if anyone had any training space available. And at that time under ARA, we had just picked up a dedicated training space that was like, you know, a few thousand square feet. And we, uh, we saw this opportunity. I raised my hand. I was like, I got 18,000 square feet in the Bronx we can do some training at. You know, fast forward a few, uh, a few months later, next thing you know, me and Adam in Ireland, and we're taking the first trade, Passive House Tradesperson course given in the English speaking world. That's me and Adam. That's Wayne and Garth there. That's uh, us at the training center, learning via Roman and the rest of the guys from the Irish team. You can see in this picture, it's a nice little video of the training process we went through. It's Adam, myself, that's Julie Moskowitz Torres, Sandra Rollers there. So it was a great experience. That's where we got our feet wet. And then when we fast forward a little further, that's myself and Adam building the training center that we eventually developed in the Bronx. Uh, that's where I met Mark. And uh, we really cut our teeth there teaching people about Passive House. So I, I, gave, uh, I gave Zach a video, if you can play that. That explains how me, myself, and uh, Adam work together. And uh, it's a quick video. It, it's got a surprise at the end of, uh, of somebody else that's in it, so. You could build a building that saved 70 to 80 percent energy and it would cost you no more than a standard building why would you not do that when you build a house to the passive house standard everyone is held to a higher standard here at the association for energy affordability we partnered with the passive house academy to bring certified passive house tradesperson training to the u.s my business partner tomorrow soliri started by building the first certified passive house in the English-speaking world. The origin of the Passive House approach has been in Germany, but we, in a sense, took it out from there and we experimented on it. One of the most important aspects of Passive House is to be able to implement it. It's all well and good that designers can come along and they can make all these fancy designs on paper and in a computer, but in reality, this is the hard graft. This is where we can either make the numbers or break the numbers. So these guys are going to be the first crew of certified Passive House tradespersons to come out of the United States. The passive house approach is an integrated whole house approach and everybody on site, everybody who works no matter what role they play needs to understand the role of everybody else and how all of this comes together. We all know that the cost of operating a passive house is significantly lower than any housing pattern that we've ever experienced. So remember this is a minimal space, sixteenth to an eighth of an inch. Since this is now in place it's going to overlap the upper part we have our insulation layer that's between the studs. We have our air tightness membrane, which is unique to a passive house. All the seams are taped and sealed. Then we've blown our insulation behind the air tightness membrane. We can get the little small leaks around the windows that we haven't quite finished yet. We'll get it right down to 0.6 or even better. Let's shoot for 0.3. I mean, it's one thing to, to see it on a slide. Application of passive house. But to, to actually see it in real life and to be fabricating it myself it really has helped a lot. When I found out about this program I was like wow this is awesome because I have an opportunity to learn about passive technology and implement it on the jobs that I'm getting involved in right now. A number of us have been on the edge of our seats for a very long time waiting to see where it was going to pop out and uh, it emerged here in New York and we jumped at the opportunity. But if you have the opportunity to learn new technologies that can uh, virtually eliminate a utility bill, you know how powerful that is? how important it is as a company to be able to say that yes, we can do a retrofit in your house that will not only reduce your bills, but almost eliminate them. By having this tradesperson training facility, we can really focus in on those folks that are gonna be turning the wrench and actually doing the work. We're not trying to radically change your industry. We're just telling you how to do things a little bit different to make the building save much, much more energy. The hope of every craftsman is, is that 100 years from now, they'll look at my work and they won't know my name, but they'll see the building and they'll, they'll, they'll still be standing. And that is achievable with Passive House.
Wowzers. Kevin, that is fantastic. Love seeing the early part of, of Mark. And so I think we should just raise our glasses, your mugs, whatever you got, and not only give a cheers to Art and Tomas for coming over and teaching Kevin and Adam, but just bravo that I like, I, I want to see that video again. I'm going to, I'm going to put on a replay for the rest of the night. Cheers everybody. And cheers, cheers. to your amazing people to get this thing started. Well, wow. go ahead, Kevin. Bravo. Great video. So very cool. That's the story of, uh, you know, almost the creation story of how that training facility opened up the doors for many people, including myself. Uh, not only uh, just the learning experience of working around people who wanted to be the best to work on the best projects. It also introduced me to uh, share my knowledge that I had from other industries like weatherization and home performance and my ability to use a blow a door uh, really was, was, was a great opportunity. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it, Adam was the leader of that team and his leadership has always been one of his, uh, his, 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 his great attributes. And now that he's at the <laughs> winters, it's great for him to, uh, you know, still be slightly involved in, in, in passive house and pushing, uh, the envelope. So, uh, I'd like to introduce Adam and, uh, he's going to share, uh, you know, one of his many facets of knowledge and, uh, let's take it from here from the basement. Yeah. So yeah, thanks, Kevin. I mean, that was that was a great opportunity. That was a great sort of part of my life where we we had, you know, for the first few months of that training, we had people from all over the world coming in. We had people from Germany and Italy coming to, you know, the Bronx to learn about Passive House and to, you know, take this training. And, you know, it was really great sort of meeting, you know, this, you know, sort of you know, this national international community and to really learn from everyone and sort of what they're doing in different parts of the world and, and how we can sort of implement that, you know, in, in the States. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was, uh, it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so you should see my presentation right now. So yeah, so my name is Adam Romano. I am a senior building systems consultant with Stephen Winter Associates. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I spent, you know, a lot of my time working at the Association for Energy Affordability, uh, 12 years really working on honing the craft, and that's where I was introduced to Passive House, and, you know, my work at SWA is really looking at, you know, sort of future-facing systems, and looking at how we can implement, you know, sort of carbon reduction strategies uh, for buildings and homes, you know, across the country, right? We're, we're looking really to reduce carbon, improve energy efficiency, and, you know, today we want to talk about some uh, DHWC systems that are more future facing than what we have sort of, you know, been working with, with conventionally. So we'll start with, you know, getting a sort of a background of kind of where we've been, you know, and what we've been sort of, you know, sort of utilizing. We'll talk about, you know, where we're going uh, and talk about, you know, some of these systems and some of the nuances when it comes to installation, sizing, selection, and, you know, sort of performance and how we can really optimize these systems to perform well in, uh, in homes and how we can scale them up to really, you know, serve load in bigger buildings. And that's kind of what we want to sort of talk about towards the end. Um, so as we get into sort of the traditional systems, I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of systems out there that we've sort of been used to for a long period of time, right? If you live in an area of the country where it's very hard to get, you know, sort of, you know, natural gas or, you know, or delivered fuels, you, you probably have some sort of electric resistive water heater. And, you know, the efficiency is not that great in terms of the, of these systems. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, you have upper heating elements, lower heating elements. And, you know, these units, you know, sort of produce, you know, domestic hot water, uh, you know, by heating a volume of water uh, inside this tank, right? Um, if you are in an area where you have, you know, access to natural gas, you may have a natural gas fire, you know, water heater, right? Uh, we're using a gas burner to, you know, go ahead and heat a volume of water and to have, you know, fluid piping going through the middle and turbulators there to try to help exchange the heat to these systems. You know, not terribly efficient. Um, if you live in the part of the country where I am from, you know, you have we see a lot of hydronic distribution. So we we have we have a lot of boilers. We have a lot of hydronic heat in in you know the part of the, you know, the New York City and the surrounding areas. And you may see you know a boiler that's you know feeding an indirect tank, right? You know this here we have a boiler feeding an indirect tank, heating a volume of water inside of that tank, uh, and that's providing domestic you know hot water to you know to a home or to a building if you scale this up. 
Now, these are sort of what we've been sort of used to traditionally, right? And, you know, what we want to sort of look at is, you know, what are some more future facing systems? What are, what are we really trying to move towards? And how do, can we utilize, you know, sort of clean electricity production to be able to sort of, you know, realize some of the carbon benefits of moving towards, you know, these types of clean energy solutions. So to do that, we need to look really at refrigerant based systems. So we are looking at, you know, sort of, you know, in this case, an integrated heat pump water heater, you know, and we'll get into sort of how these operate and how they, how they function. But the idea is, you know, you're using a refrigerant to be able to absorb and reject heat, uh, you know, from an airstream in this case into a volume of water. Uh, and, you know, there is a sort of an uh, increase in efficiency when you're able to utilize a vapor compression cycle uh, and you have this refrigeration effect where now you have coefficients of performance that are much higher than what you have with a standard electric tank. Um, so we're able to utilize that clean electricity and we're we'll able to now, you know, sort of, you know, improve it, you know, above, you know, sort of 100% efficiency with, you know, COPs that are hey. than one and then get into sort of, you know, how do we you know, sort of make the carbon reduction, you know, sort of re uh, realized. Um, you have systems like this or you can have split systems. And we'll talk a little bit about how each how each works and some of the pros and cons of each one and sort of where do we find that you know these systems can work well so here you're you know uh instead of having sort of an integrated sort of heat pump system with a volume a tank of you know water now you, you split those apart where you have now an outdoor unit that is the heat pump component that's generating heat injecting heat into a water stream and then as a circulator that's moving that heat into a, a sort of a storage tank um, and, you know, now you're able to now split that out and, you know, there's different refrigerants that are using these types of systems, possibly, depending on the scale and the size and the type. Um, but we'll get into so all those details, you know, in a little bit, uh, uh, in a little bit down in the presentation, but those are kind of what we're looking at more refrigerant based systems. And the reason why we're so interested in that, again, is, as I mentioned, the refrigeration cycle allows us to take advantage of higher efficiencies, right? We don't want to utilize electric resistive where we have COPs of one. We want to be able to, you know, utilize this refrigerant cycle where we have a compressor, we have, you know, expansion valves, we have a source in a sink where we're moving heat. We're not generating heat. That's the thing. Like every time you generate heat, there's associated losses be behind that, right? If you combust the fuel, you're going to lose some of that heat through, you know, sort of a, in a heat exchanger and through the flue pipes and to the outdoor. We're here we're really moving heat from that source to the sink and we're also absorbing excess heat from the compressor. So that's where we kind of get those efficiencies that we're looking for. Uh, and again, we're taking advantage of that clean electricity that, you know, we're going to produce via renewables uh, and be able to, you know, sort of you know, realize that, that, you know, the carbon reduction. Now, not all refrigerants are created equal. That's one thing we have to pay attention to. So when we're looking at, you know, heat pump systems, you know, across the spectrum, whether it's for space conditioning or it's domestic hot water production, we really have to look into, you know, refrigerants for smart electrification. And we have to pay attention to the global warming potential of these refrigerants, right? You know, if we're, the idea with behind all this, you know, and, and all of our efforts is to really reduce carbon. That's the goal, right? We really want to sort of see your carbon reduction. And, you know, and, you know, carbon is, you know, uh, you know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it contributes to global warming. Now, refrigerants are a very bad <laughs> a greenhouse gas. So what we want to pay attention to is when we're selecting systems for our operation, we also want to pay attention to the global warming potential of those refrigerants. So some refrigerants that we commonly see, R410A, R134A, all have very high global warming potentials, you know, 2000 times worse than carbon, uh, 1400 times worse than carbon. So we, we need to pay attention to not only selecting systems that have lower, you know, have refrigerants that are, you know, that have lower GWPs, but also, you know, during the field fabrication part, you know, so, you know, part of this is really making sure that we're installing these systems correctly. Um, and it's more sort of the case with, you know, our, our space conditioning systems. But the idea is we really need to make sure that we are, you know, doing our due diligence and we're making sure that any part of the refrigeration circuit that's field fabricated is taken care of. We have to make sure that it's done correctly. It's, you know, the you know, connections are well, well made. We have, you know, sort of, you know, verification that we have no leaks because what we don't want to do is we don't want to sort of negate all the carbon savings by having, you know, emissions take place because of uh, refrigerant leaks, right? They contribute significantly lead to the global warming effect uh, by having those refrigerants leak out into the atmosphere. Now, there has been a, been a big push in the industry. And if you've been keeping up, as I'm sure a lot of you have, there's a lot of, you know, sort of push towards newer refrigerants that have lower GWPs, right? R466A, 
is one of those. In the automobile industry, you're seeing a lot of hydrofluoro olefins, you know, 134YF. You see that a lot in, you know, automobile, you know, sort of air conditioning circuits. Um, and there's a big push for natural refrigerants. And we're going to talk a little bit about carbon dioxide, R744, as a refrigerant. Um, and, you know, very low GWP, because that's kind of what the scale is based off of, is carbon dioxide. Um, but uh, very interesting in sort of how it operates and where it can be applied. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, just understand that refrigerants, you know, are great and they're going to be able to help us get to our carbon or low carbon future. But we do need to pay attention to, you know, sort of the refrigerants that we're using and making sure that, you know, the you know, systems that we're installing them into and, you know, the field fabrication work is done correctly. Now, before we get started with any of this, you know, where do we start, right? Before we start talking about domestic water product, hot water production, you know, uh, this is back to sort of Gary, right? Gary Klein has been you know, sort of a legend in the industry in terms of how, you know, we sort of, you know, uh, maximize the distribution systems, reduce energy, increase, improve energy efficiency, and make sure that we're delivering hot water effectively to the building. We're not wasting things, wasting water. And that's really where we need to start. Before we even talk about generation, we need to talk about distribution. We need to make sure that we're designing the distribution system correctly, we're reducing flows, we are making sure that we are, you know, uh, insulating pipes, we're reducing standby losses, you know, all of these things that, you know, we take for granted sometimes, we really need to make sure that we have a good understanding of that, and we're really making sure that's taking place. So, you know, we have, you know, sort of recommended flow rates that, you know, sort of we utilize, you know, and uh, really the idea is to really lower those flow rates, because that's not, not only going to help with, you know, sizing and the initial size, it's going to help with, you know, sizing storage, it's going to reduce the storage capacity that we need, it's going to help our systems recover more effect effectively. And the idea is to really get those flow rates down as low as we can without, you know, generating complaints. So there's kind of a threshold there. So, you know, what we kind of look at is, you know, one GPM for bathroom sinks, you know, one and a half for shower and kitchen, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of faucets in, in terms of GPM. And we really kind of want to try to get close to half a GPM, but we don't want to get into the area because that's where we started from our, you know, sort of experience where we sort of see complaints come in is when we get down that low to the half a GPM in, in residences. So the idea is to really improve the efficiency first, you know, sort of scrutinize over that design, make sure that the hot water distribution system is, is you know, is really well done. And then let's talk about, you know, production, because you know, this is really where a lot of the waste takes place. So when we talk about production, we have a couple different types, like as we sort of alluded to earlier, we have integrated heat pump water heaters, where, you know, there's a couple different options out there. There's a variety of manufacturers that, you know, sort of produce these, this equipment. And, you know, typically, you know, what we're doing is we have a, you know, a heat pump unit that is located on top of this tank, uh, sort of it's integrated. So there's, you know, it, it's directly connected. So we have a compressor that's driving a refrigeration cycle. We have an evaporator up here at the top of this uh, tank. We have room air entering in through this tank. It's being absorbed, uh, and heat is being absorbed at the refrigerant in this evaporator coil. The cold air is now leaving. So we're, you know, we're reducing the temperature of that air. We're also dehumidifying that air as well. And then the heat that we absorbed goes to the, it goes into the compressor, the temperature is raised, the pressure is raised, and now we can go ahead and uh, inject that heat into this volume of water. And, you know, these, you know, systems work fairly well. There are, you know, most of these systems do have some sort of electric backup. And that's something we're going to talk about in a couple of slides is sort of reducing the, you know, sort of utilization of electric backup because it's there in case there are any issues. Uh, and, you know, there are certain sort of situations or scenarios where that, you know, utilization comes becomes pretty high. And we want to pay attention to that when during operation and sizing to really ensure that we have a low prevalence of, of electric resistive utilization. But, you know, water comes out of this tank, it goes into a mixing valve, we mix it down, we send that out to the building, um, and, you know, we provide sufficient hot water for these systems. Now, we did a study a few years ago, uh, SWA uh, did a study looking at, you know, 14 integrated heat pump water heaters in Massachusetts and Rhode Island for over a year. And what we were trying to do with this is sort of develop best practices in terms of sizing, selection, installation, to really make sure that, you know, we are, you know, sort of, you know, installing these systems correctly, we're sizing them correctly, you know, we're selecting them correctly, uh, and we're setting them up for success. That was, you know, really the idea. Um, so we looked at these 14 different uh, systems, you know, from a variety of different manufacturers, and we saw a huge range in coefficient of performance, you know, from uh, down to one, which, you know, is pretty much putting an electric resistive tank um, up into 2.6, you know, so we had, you know, some sort of uh, increase in efficiency uh, with, with operation. And what we found that really sort of, you know, impacted efficiency were two different things, two main things really impacted efficiency. And, you know, one of those was hot water use. So when we had situations where there were 
were concentrated draws, where we had times where we had, you know, high flow fixtures, uh, and we had, you know, folks that were taking, you know, 30 minute showers, and we had huge draws coming through. That's where we had a high utilization of electric resistive heat. So you can see here on the left that we know this graph here is showing, you know, hot water use uh, on this, you know, axis here. We have the time of the, the year, and then we have electricity used in watt hours over here. And what you see is in the blue is the hot water use. So we're mapping the profile. So we measure the flow rate going into the, uh, the hot water heater uh, or the water heater. Let's not forget. Uh, and uh, we also had the sort of the heat pump electric consumption here in green, uh, and then the electric resistive utilization here in red. And we can see as you know the uh, you know sort of the you know the hot water consumption spiked you know on this day here on the 23rd of of uh, November, and we had you know a, a concentrated draw. We can see that you know right along that path we had electric utilization you know spike up. So we were utilizing a heat pump and it was running at you know less than 200 watt hours uh, during operation. Once that electric resistive, you know, element was engaged, uh, we were up over a thousand watt hours. So you can see there was a big impact in our coefficient of performance um, as we started to have those instances of concentrated draws, right? When we had, you know, the times where, you know, folks were really using a lot of water and that goes back to making sure that our systems, our distribution system and our fixtures are sized correctly to prevent those concentrated draws. And it also goes back to sort of end user education as well, because that's one of the things that you can, we kind of struggle with with domestic hot water is that we don't know, you know, how people are going to use this. We can't change behaviors. We can try to influence behaviors, but it's sometimes it's very hard to change folks' uh, behaviors. The other thing that, you know, impacts efficiencies with these integrated units is obviously ambient temperature. You know, as a temperature in the space where the integrated heat pump water heater is located drops, we have, you know, sort of uh, lower COPs and we have higher energy used, right? We have, you know, the inlet temperature here is plotted in blue, uh, and you can see it's varying based on, you know, the time of the year. Uh, and we have the heat pump energy, which is staying pretty constant, again, below that 200 watt hours. Uh, and then times where we do have crashes in the ambient uh, temperature, we start to see that lower heating element or the electric element start to be utilized again. So again, it's also, you know, the space temperature as well. So, you know, this, you know, was installed in a location where there wasn't sufficient air. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well, how we need to make sure that these units have the appropriate amount of airflow through them to, in order to make sure they're operating correctly. And we sort of had crashes, you know, from, you know, down to, you know, 45 degrees, almost 45 degrees in that space. And that had a huge impact on, you know, the heat pump operation because as the temperature, ambient temperature drops, it becomes very, very hard to harvest heat from that, from that air. So what do we do to try to combat this? Now, it, which is, it's kind of counterintuitive when you think about it, when it comes to integrated tanks, what we found is, you know, through this study is that, you know, sort of bigger is better and hotter is better. Um, and it, it's kind of, you know, sort of counter to what we, what we think, right? You know, unlike, unlike most water heaters, increasing the set point is going to increase efficiency. So let's talk a little bit about that. As we increase the set point of the tank, that means the tank, by, the water in the, in the tank is going to increase in temperature. And if we have a, we're utilizing a mixing valve to mix down that temperature, that means as we start to deliver uh, hot water to the building, we're going to have a higher, you know, sort of, uh, you know, a utilization of that cold water coming in, blending that water temperature down. So we're going to be bringing more cold water in to blend with the hot water coming out of the tank to be able to deliver the desired temperature to the building. So we're able to now sort of, you know, uh, keep a, a tank temperature higher and utilize more volume from the city water main as opposed to drawing from the tank. So again, that's going to you know, sort of you know help with those concentrated draws because now we're bringing more of the volume from the city as opposed from the tank that needs to be recovered uh, you know using the heat pump unit. Other thing is that you know bigger is better, right? The more volume we have, the easier it is for us to have this buffer capacity that's built in. So you know if we have those times of concentrated draws, we may need this buffer capacity to help make these units work a little bit better. So we want to be able to draw down on that tank instead of having to engage the the heat pump unit to run, you know, more, uh, you know, sort of, you know, uh, more often, or worse yet, engage the electric resistive heat to replenish that tank. So in this case, when you're looking at integrated tanks and you're sizing them, you know, you want to pay attention to, you know, sort of again making sure that the flow rate are low, 
but you also want to pay attention to, you know, sort of the, the buffer capacity as well as, you know, sort of the temperatures that you're looking to provide in order to try to maintain, you know, higher efficiencies by reducing the utilization of that electric resistance. And to do that, we really need to install mixing valves. So one of the things, if you're going to send higher water temperatures out, or if we're going to sort of maintain water temperatures in excess of 120 degrees, we do want to make sure that we are utilizing anti-scald valves or mixing valves to be able to blend that cold water from the city supply to uh, go ahead and bring that temperature down. And again, that'll allow us to use more volume from the city water supply as opposed to drawing off of that tank. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that we get those temperatures down, you know, to 120 degrees through that mixing valve. Now, other things you have to pay attention to, you know, there's a variety of other things besides, you know, sort of the, the volume and the draw and the sizing and the selection of these units. We also need to pay attention to how they're installed, right? So we need to look at space requirements, comfort and noise. We have to manage condensate. Uh, we want to install heat traps and we want to make sure that the homeowners understand how to, uh, you know, maintain these systems in order to promote efficiency. So we do need to make sure that we have appropriate space, uh, you know, sort of volume for these units. You know, typically we're looking at, you know, at least 800 square uh, cubic feet of air for these units to be able to operate. And we need to make sure that we have free airflow. So if we're trying to install these in, you know, sort of a, a closet or a smaller room, we need to find ways that we can bring air, you know, to this unit in order for it to operate effectively. So it, it may be ducting air from another location. Um, you know, you want to pay attention to where the discharge is, like this unit here was discharging against a exterior interior uh, basement wall and we had you know some recirculation of that cold air as it hit that wall it rebounded and it went towards the, you know, the intake and we sort of had recirculation taking place which impact performance because the air that was coming out was recirculating back and it was cold and dry so there was less heat for us, us to absorb. Um, so that's something we have to pay attention to is where we site these units uh, and how we sort of make sure we have the appropriate airflow. Now, from the passive house perspective, these, this could be sort of, you know, interesting, right? Um, you can get creative with these units, right? Um, you know, you may have high, a higher prevalence of overheating in passive house projects, right? Because we are insulating very, very well. We have maybe some internal gains that we can take advantage of. So these units can work well in situations where maybe we can sort of duct from those areas that have, you know, high internal gains and try to utilize that air to be able to now produce domestic hot water, right? So we can get a little bit creative about how we sort of, you know, sort of site these units or how we duct these units in order to sort of increase, you know, uh, efficiency uh, and to sort of of, you know, improve overall performance, right? Because that's one thing that, you know, these units will take advantage of is those internal gains that we're trying to sort of mitigate uh, through the, the passive house design or through comfort cooling if, if it were speak. The other thing we have to pay attention to is noise. Right, so you know, if you're locating a uh, refrigerant-based system indoors, you have a compressor and you have fans, and those units are going to, uh, those components are going to generate noise. Um, so here on the left, we have a decibel meter, and we are uh, right adjacent to a integrated heat pump water heater, and we're measuring about 50, 50, uh, 50 decibels. Right, so if for comparison, you have a refrigerator and a vacuum, and you know the on average, you know we found that during that study of the 14 different units that we looked at, on average we found about uh, most of those units produced about 55 decibels. Um, so you know, an average refrigerator is about 45, uh, and average vacuum is about 70. So we're kind of you know almost halfway in between those two you know appliances. Um, so it's louder than the refrigerator, and it's quieter than the vacuum, which is still pretty noisy. So we also have to pay attention to sort of where we site these units, you know, when it, if they're adjacent to living spaces, you know, or occupied spaces, um, you know, we have those noise concerns. And what we don't want to see happen, in which we saw in the study, um, was, you know, homeowners who were able to, you know, sort of um, go ahead and disable the heat pump portion of the unit uh, because of the noise. They were fed up with the noise, they were fed up, you know, that it was loud, uh, and they were able to find a way to go ahead and deactivate the heat pump portion. And this became a very expensive, um, very inefficient uh, electric resistive tank, right? That's what ended up happening with a lot of these projects um because they were sited in the wrong spot so we really need to pay attention to noise concerns and maybe that's you know adding insulation inside of the wall space maybe it's you know it's adding you know sound attenuation to be able to try to you know reduce the transmission of sound to these spaces that's something we have to pay attention to when we're citing these they could be great for you know uh, relieving overheating but we also have to pay attention to you know we don't want you know them to be sabotaged or you know be through you know sort of operation because of you know homeowners looking at them and saying hey this is too loud. I, I can't deal with this.
The other thing that they pay attention to is comfort, right? So besides noise, right, when you're citing these indoors, you know, you are cooling the air, right? That's that's the byproduct of running an integrated heat pump water heater is that you're taking heat from the air, you're harvesting that heat, you're injecting it into the volume of water, and you're cooling that airstream. So now that cold air is discharged into the space. And then sometimes, you know, it's beneficial. And sometimes, you know, it's not beneficial, and it can really lower the ambient temperature. And that can have, you know, an additional strain on our mechanicals or cause, you know, comfort issues, right? We have, you know, especially when you talk about, you know, spaces that don't have a lot of volume, right? So when these are misapplied and they're put into, you know, areas where you have, you know, lower, you know, lower volume and we don't have enough fresh air coming into this or air coming into the and into that space for that unit to be able to work properly, we start to see a drastic drop in temperature because now there's not a lot of air movement and that air that's kind of continually recirculating and we're dropping and dropping and dropping in ambient temperature. So this was, you know, a picture of a multifamily sort of uh, integration where we had a unit in a closet that was feeding an apartment. And what do you see down here on the bottom left? Uh, electric resistive uh, you know, heater, right? This heater was utilized because the temperature inside this space got down to you know, the low 40s. Uh, and you know, they put electric resistive heater in here to compensate for that uh, and uh, you know, to go ahead and heat that space up. Um, so we, we don't want to see this happen, right? This is, this, is, this is super inefficient. This is counterproductive. This is not what we want to see in terms of, uh, you know, siting and, and operation. So we have to pay attention again, where are we putting these units and, you know, really understand that we are going to sort of cool the space down by running these uh, integrated heat pump water heaters. The other side of this is that we have condensate management, right? We have to manage the condensate. You know, we have, you know, areas, especially if you put these in basements and we have, you know, higher relative humidities possibly, we need to pay attention to how are we going to manage that condensate because as you know the evaporator coil is under low temperature and low pressure you know we are going to sort of bring that air across you know we are going to condense the the moisture in that air um, it needs to drain down and it needs to be managed we need to be able to get rid of that that moisture so we want to make sure that you know we are installing sort of ancillary systems like condensate pumps uh, to make sure that we are dealing with that condensate and we don't have situations where we have you know a tank sitting inside you know a you know couple inches of water uh, that's going to sort of deteriorate that that tank uh, over time. So this is something that we also have to pay attention to that we wouldn't normally pay attention to with our traditional, you know, uh, domestic water heaters. The other thing we have to pay attention to is, you know, is heat traps. Like we don't want to see, like, you know, if we're really trying to maintain, you know, proper efficiency and we're trying to, you know, sort of keep that storage temperature high. The other thing we want we do want to try to prevent is any type of migration of heat, right? Um, so as we, you know, as heat up water, water is going to become, you know, more buoyant. It's the hot water is going to rise. So, you know, if you go down into your homes right now and you go and you touch both, you know, uh, the cold and the hot supply to your, you know, residential tank type water heater, you're going to feel probably a hot, hot uh, water coming out of that cold, uh, uh, hot. So you're going to feel heat out of that cold water supply. And it's due to the buoyancy differences of, of, of water, because as you heat water up, it becomes lighter. It's going to naturally move, you know, upward. Right. And what we don't want to happen is to have that heat migrate into the distribution system through the cold water side uh, and, you know, cause, you know, additional off cycle losses. So we want to, you know, install heat traps um, and that goes for any type of volume water heater. Anytime that we are, you know, um, you know, storing a volume of water, we're going to have the potential for heat migration. Uh, and what we want to do is install in heat traps, which are sort of just, in, you know, inverted loops, which are going to sort of, you know, counteract that flow uh, and try to keep, you know, the hot water water inside of that storage tank, right? Because the idea is, you know, keep it there so it, it can stay inside an insulated, you know, uh, tank as opposed to migrating through the distribution system. And again, making sure that we have, you know, the proper insulation on our pipes is going to be important, again, to reduce, you know, those standby losses uh, and those distribution losses. Um, and again, but also going back to sort of making sure that we size our our distribution system correctly because we don't want to have, you know, an increased volume of water in our distribution system that that we don't need. So it's really you know, scrutinizing the pipe sizes and making sure that, you know, we are, you know, providing the, the right amount uh, of volume, the right amount of flow that we need to, you know, serve our fixtures, uh, but doing that, you know, in an appropriate way as opposed to having excess volume in the system that's just going to contribute to off cycle losses. And then we have to provide maintenance, right? You know, you're moving air through these systems, you have filters that need to be cleaned, you have coils that can get dirty. So we really do need to have that education where we need 
to sort of transfer that knowledge, you know, from the installation contractor or the consultant to the homeowner to make sure that they're operating these systems effectively. I mean, I spent a lot of my career installing, you know, sort of new technology in buildings and in homes. And, you know, you see a lot of times that these, you know, new, this new technology gets, you know, sort of undermined by, you know, sort of inadequate maintenance and inadequate, you know, sort of operation. So what we want to try to do is really make sure that education piece is there, that we're really transferring that knowledge and that, you know, the homeowners or the occupants or the building management or the building operation staff really understand how to maintain these units and what needs to happen because we don't want to see them fail, you know, down the road. We don't want to see them have great, you know, sort of results in year one, two, three, uh, but then sort of, you know, the results kind of peter off because of lack of maintenance um, because, you know, any all these systems are going to require some routine maintenance to me, you know, in order to work properly. And again, this is foreign. Like, this is something totally different than what, you know, sort of, you know, most people are, are sort of, you know, used to. People don't really think about their water heater. It just goes into their basement and it just works, right? You know, now that the fact that you have to maintain it and you have to do, you know, sort of, you know, uh, routine maintenance and, and changing filters and things like that, that's just, that's not, you know, sort of common. So we need to make sure that we have that transfer of knowledge uh, to really set ourselves up for success. So that's just one type. And, you know, I want to be cognizant of time. The other side we want to get into is sort of split systems. So to sort of alleviate some of the issues with, you know, comfort and noise and, you know, sort of ambient temperature reduction or things like that, uh, we can look at, you know, splitting these units up, right? So uh, there's a variety of companies that make, you know, sort of outdoor, you know, heat, uh, heat pump water heaters that, you know, have, you know, the heat pump, you know, located on the outdoors. We're harvesting heat from outside. So that alleviates a lot of the noise concerns, the comfort concerns. Um, but there's also, you know, sort of challenges with that, right? If you live in an area where it's a cold climate, um, you, it's going to become increasingly harder to harvest heat from the outside when the temperature drops. And one of the things that, you know, we, you know, sort of, you know, want to touch on here is refrigerant, right? Refrigerant has a big impact on overall performance, right? The refrigerant that's circulating through the system has a imp big impact on what kind of discharge temperatures I can produce at a heat pump. And you know, some of our conventional refrigerants like 410A and 134A I, I have a hard time really generating that kind of lift when we, we want to see when we have very low ambient temperatures. So if we're trying to harvest heat from you know 10 degree you know ambient temperatures to provide 160 degrees at a tank uh, to you know 160 degree out to provide 140 at a tank, you know it may be very difficult for 410A or 130. For a to be able to do that. Um, and CO2 has become an option that, you know, is kind of works really well in that environment where we have the bigger the delta T, the kind of, you know, the, you know, the more, you know, sort of CO2 really likes that environment. Um, and, you know, what we find is that this could be a good solution, you know, for those low ambient temperature environments where we want to go ahead and provide, you know, um, you know, uh, domestic hot water, but we want to do it with, you know, a split type unit. Because what happens when we try to use torrential refrigerants and this is just one particular manufacturer and one particular unit. And you look at, you know, a couple things happen. So as the temperature outdoor drops, you know, two things are going to happen, right? We're going to uh, lower our efficiency. Our COPs are going to drop, right? Our coefficient of performance is going to go down because there's less heat available outside to harvest heat from, right? So as the temperature goes down, we don't have that delta T anymore, right? We're, we're trying to harvest heat from an increasingly lower temperature. And that's going to impact energy costs and savings, right? We're going to be able to, we have to move more refrigerant. We're going to have to run the system longer. We're going to have, you know, sort of, you know, higher recovery times. Uh, and that's going to impact you know, our overall efficiency because now we're going to be spending more money to go ahead and try to provide the right amount of heat output that we need. The other thing that happens is our capacity drops, right? So it's a couple, it's almost like a double whammy, right? You know, our capacity also drops when the outdoor temperature falls. And when that happens, that's going to impact our sizing, right? So you know, the idea is that we need to be able to provide the adequate amount of, you know, of hot water to the building or to hot water to a home. And, you know, typically we buffer that with, you know, a volume of water, right? A 55 gallon tank, an 80 gallon tank, 119 gallon tank, whatever it may be. And that allows us to be able to have these draws off that tank and allows us adequate time for that heat pump to be able to make up that hot water so that we don't run out of water, right? But what happens is the temperature drops drops, we start to sort of reduce capacity. So our, you know, makeup time starts to sort of drop and our ability to make up drops. So you know, in those situations, if you're designing it from an engineering perspective, you know, we know that we're going to have this capacity drop. I need to be able to build in more storage. I need to be able to say, hey, I can't run out of hot water. You know, I need to maybe double or triple or quadruple my storage capacity in order for me to have that battery that's there that can sort of be charged during times of higher outdoor ambient temperature. So I can go ahead and utilize that heat when I need it, when the temperature drops, and then slowly make up that you know, water temperature as I'm drawing off those tanks. And that's going to impact first cost. That's going to impact, you know, uh, 
the off cycle losses that's going to impact you know just space to be able to put these units there um so there's a lot of things that happen with your traditional refrigerants um and you know we especially if you're dealing for cold climates these may not be the best choice for a cold climate so what we're looking at is utilizing heat pump water heaters that utilize co2 as opposed to 410a and 134a and you know what we find with these types of units is that we have zero capacity loss down to very cold ambient temperatures, right? CO2 really loves that big delta T. It loves to be able to pull cold water in, heat it up, and send it out, right? That's it, it works well in those environments. So we have very little capacity loss, you know, with that. And it's a different type of a cycle. It's, you know, as opposed to, you know, you know, it's a refrigerant cycle, but it's, you know, it's a different type. It's much higher pressure um, and it's, it operates a little bit different than our traditional refrigerants. But we also have very high efficiencies as well during those low ambient temperatures. So we're kind of alleviating some of those, you know, concerns of, you know, um, issues with, you know, storage and capacity, you know, by moving towards, you know, a, you know, uh, a different type of refrigerant based system. Now, the issue we have is that we don't have a lot of these systems available. And that's, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes and how we kind of scale it up and make it bigger. But what we have here is this is, you know, a, a field evaluation that was done looking at the difference between split Heat, heat pump water heaters and integrated heat pump water heaters. And what you find here is, you know, it's average, you know, uh, out, outside air temperature and degree centigrade, you know, along this axis and COP along this axis. And, you know, in blue here, you have a uh, CO2 based um, uh, water heater. And then in orange, you have an integrated water heater. And you find that, you know, if you look at, you know, sort of the, you know, the average and you look at, you know, sort of, the, you know, the linear regression here, we see that, you know, the, obviously the, you know, the CO2 based you know, water heater provides much higher, you know, sort of efficiencies in terms of COP across, you know, all variety of temperatures. But what's interesting is when you start to see what you see here on these liters per day, uh, the, the smaller dots is obviously less draw, the, you know, the larger dots are larger draw. What you find is that a lot of the larger draws, you know, you're seeing much, much higher COPs, right? So as you start to draw more water off of this tank, right? What's happening? You're bringing colder water in from the, the water supply and that cold water is going across that, that heat pump. And that's kind of what that you know, CO2 really loves is that big delta T. And you start to see the COPs increase as the draw increases. It's kind of counterintuitive. You would think, oh yeah, as draw increases, you know, we're going to have you know, less efficiency. But with this type of system, it's really kind of counter, counter to what you would typically believe. And you can see that the COPs, you know, even at you know, very low ambient temperatures, are much higher when you have those larger draws. And that's really due to bringing more of that colder water in and really uh, uh, facilitating that large uh, delta T. Um, and th that's you know, sort of shown here in the manufacturer's literature, right? If you look at heat pump inlet water temperature here uh, compared to COP, you can see as the heat pump inlet water temperature increases, the COP starts to drop because again, it's harder to inject that heat into a warmer water temperature, right? It's just, it's, that's what happens, right? If I, you know, it's, it's a basic physics, the delta T is gonna drive heat transfer. And if I have a bigger delta T, I'm gonna have larger heat transfer. And if I have a shorter delta T, I'm gonna have less heat transfer. I'm gonna have more loss. And you see that with our space conditioning systems as well. Like if you look at ductless units that are mounted really high on, you know, on high wall assemblies and you have, you know, warm air coming into the top of that return, you're reducing the delta T between the return air and that coil, and that's going to impact performance. And you're going to have lower COP realization because now the delta T is less. Same thing goes here, right? We have, you know, the bigger delta Ts, we're having higher efficiency. So we have to pipe them differently. What we need to do is we can't pipe our traditional storage tanks the way we sort of do this, you know, in the conventional sense, right? We need to be able to get that cold water off the bottom of the tank. So here is, you know, sort of a diagram of the outdoor unit and the indoor unit. Here's the storage tank and here's the piping that's connecting those two, you know, those two connections. And we see that we're injecting that hot water into the top of the tank. We're allowing stratification to take place, right? We're allowing that hot water to migrate towards the top. We're allowing the cold water to stay at the bottom. And we're pulling that cold water off that bottom to get out to that heat exchanger to facilitate that large delta T. We don't want to see blending in this tank. If we blend this tank and we start to sort of mix it around, you know, the average temperature goes up, that's going to impact, you know, our COP. And we don't want to see that. So we really want to pipe these correctly. And that's really what it comes back to when we get into a couple seconds on how we talk about, you know, sort of installation. We really want to see, you know, the cold water coming back. So we have to pipe these in the appropriate way. And the manufacturers really specify that very, very well. But the idea is really getting that cold water coming back in order for us to have those higher higher COPs. There's other things we have to pay attention to. 
just like you would with, you know, a traditional split base, you know, uh, you know, uh, space conditioning system, you got to be aware of, you know, uh, max horizontal and vertical distance. We have a talk about insulating the, you know, the lines. We have water lines now that are traveling from the outside to the inside. We have to maybe in sort of, in, in, in sort of implement freeze protection in really cold climates. We may need heat trace or things like that to be able to uh, prevent those pipes from freezing uh, during times of, you know, of non-use. Uh, and we want to make sure it's properly supported. The other thing we have to pay attention to is, you know, sort of making sure these are off off the ground, right? We have to look at anticipated snowfall amounts. We have to make sure that we have proper airflow because, again, these are going to run all year round, right? So we have to make sure that, you know, in the winter time when we have snow drifts and, you know, six feet of snow or whatever, if we're in Buffalo, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, those units are up on a bracket or on a sidewall or something to get them up off the ground to allow the free flow of air and also to allow, you know, adequate time for defrost and adequate drainage for defrost. You know, these units are going to go into defrost as that coil outside it gets colder right because it's got to get cold to be able to harvest heat from you know an outdoor temperature that's cold we have to be colder than the outdoor temperature and if that's the case and any moisture in the air where it's going to freeze up on that just like it would with a space conditioning system so we have to be able to allow for that drainage and you know we need to get them elevated to be able to facilitate that um, and the last thing we're going to talk about before we end i know we're getting close to time is scaling these systems up. How do we make this work in bigger, you know, bigger buildings, right? You know, it's one thing to do this in a small home, uh, in a residential, you know, sort of one to four family, whatever it may be, but how do we scale it up to bigger buildings? How do we scale this up to multifamily? Can we do that, right? So, you know, integrated heat pump water heaters, you know, can be scaled up. We have an example here where we manifolded, you know, uh, you know, a variety of these together, whole bank of them together. But the issue with it is, you need to be able to have, you know, a heat source. We need excess heat. We need to be able to, if you're going to put all these together in a room, you know, and you don't have adequate heat in that room or adequate waste heat, that room is going to get very, very cold. And these systems are going to have a very high, you know, sort of utilization of that electric resistive heat. So we want to make sure they're within the condition space. We also want to pay attention to where the intakes are. Like we don't want to start see recirculation. So if we have intake and exhaust, if let's say if we are exhausting them outside and we're, you know, we're doing that, we want to pay attention to where they are because we don't want them to fight. We don't want recirculation between the exhaust and the intakes. Uh, and we, again, we need to make sure that room temperature is at least 50 to 60 degrees without electric resistive heat. This was a project we went to and it's hard to, it's, I don't have it shown on here, but in the top right corner uh, over here on the opposite wall, we have, you know, sort of two electric resistive heaters here that are heating that space up because the space temperature dropped down into the low 40s because these units are operating harvesting as much heat as they can from that space so we, we definitely can't do that we need enough waste heat to be able to make these work when we're you know installing them in a in, indoor space um, can we scale up, you know, split systems, right? There's a variety of units that are out there to really scale this up on the commercial side. You have a variety of manufacturers that have, you know, commercial grade, you know, modular sort of engineered solutions that we can provide. Uh, and a lot of them are really, in, you know, we see a lot of market penetration in Asia and Europe. We don't see as much in the U.S., but the ones that are here typically utilize, you know, refrigerants that don't really supply very good outlet temperatures at, you know, low ambient, right? So for areas of the country where you don't have, you know, very low design temperatures, your design temperature is not is pretty moderate these may work very very great i mean i we have i have colleagues that you know work in you know uh former colleagues that work in san francisco that you know utilize these systems with great success out there uh the problem is when you try to bring them into cold climates you know you have issues where you know i'm not producing hot enough water to really prevent legionella growth right what i'm really worried about is making sure that i have you know enough uh, uh, uh you know sort of temperature coming out hot enough temperature coming out of this charge that i can maintain good temperature in my tanks that i don't have any legionella concerns and i can't do that you know right now with the existing systems that are utilizing 410a uh, I can do it with it, systems that have CO2 based uh, refrigerant cycles, uh, but there's again, very few that are available in the US. So what are we doing, right? At SWA, we are looking at, you know, try to scale We're trying to solve this problem, right? We're trying to say, can we scale these units up with the technology that we have today, you know, and, and sort of future proofing for new technology that can come up, you know, sort of years from now. So this is a project we're working on uh, up in uh, the Bronx, uh, where we are looking at, you know, citing, you know, uh, 14 of these, you know, CO2 based, you know, water heaters in a sort of, uh, you know, primary secondary configuration where we have a pump based in the basement, it's sending you know, heat up, uh, sending water up to a riser, that riser is then connecting through a secondary circuit to our uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, that is going ahead and, and generating heat, sending water into that circuit, they're going down to storage tanks in the basement, and and then they're providing heat for the building. So we're scaling these up and trying to ganging these together uh, to provide uh, you know, the capacity that we need to serve 100% load in this building and also have enough
enough storage in the basement to be able to withstand those concentrated draws uh, without impacting performance. Um, and this is for a 50 unit, you know, building uh, out in the Bronx. Um, and, you know, we should have some data. We're commissioning it now. We should probably have some data, you know, later on in the year. Um, so stay tuned for that, you know, for, you know, blog posts or whatever we may have from, uh, from my colleagues at SWA. But um, that's, you know, what we're working on to try to solve this now. And also, you know, set ourselves up for the future, right? Let's say if there are options down the road and, you know, 10 years when these systems fail or 15 years, whatever the lifespan is, we can go ahead and plug in a new unit that can, you know, can work, right? We're, we're trying to future proof, you know, for, for you know, for, uh, you know, future installations. Awesome. So that was the Mexico water in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job, my friend. I mean, uh, that was a very technical uh, presentation on hot water, and uh, we've got some questions brewing up. I'm so sure, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, to bring up, and something we've spoken about in the past, is, uh, you know, distribution efficiency. I spoke to yeah. your team at, uh, I mean, distribution and Passive House. One of the key components of Passive House is to make sure all the hot water pipes are insulated properly. And in our multifamily projects that we're working, they see out in the field, I talked to Chris Hamm and, uh, and, yep. and Mike O'Donnell, and they said yep. that they're seeing that the hot water piping it needs a lot of coaching because yep. of the, uh, the, the, the insulators insulating the pipes are just saying, oh, we're putting a pipe insulation on them. That's all the same size. But uh, the, it's my understanding that you want to have two times the diameter of the insulation on the pipe for optimum uh, insulation qualities. And a lot of times in the field, they see pipes that are larger than uh, three quarters of an inch, uh, closer to an inch and a half, aren't getting the right amount of uh, pipe insulation out there. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, it's you know, to you know, I'm sure Gary can you know, elaborate on this, you know, much more than I can. But you know, the idea is that you know, you have you know, water that's going through the distribution system that is hot, right? And it's sitting there, and if it's not being utilized, it's going to you know lose that heat, and we're going to have to reheat that, especially in multifamily where you may have recirculation loops that are moving water through that you know, distribution system. It's like a big baseboard, it's like a big radiator, right? So the idea is, you know, if you don't insulate that, you're going to have that loss, right? Um, so you know, we need to make sure that you know the insulation not only is the right size and it's the right R value, uh, it's continuous, it's not compressed, you know, all the things that you know we talk about, you know, in in building science class and you know and that's something that you know a lot of folks you know gloss over because hey you know it's dhw you know uh it's not a big deal uh it's not heating the space um but uh but it can contribute to overheating of buildings it can contribute to a lot of problems so um that's something we do need to pay attention to all right good stuff adam hold on take yourself a breath get you know get some air into your lungs or have have a sip of whatever you're drinking uh, Zach, we're going to go to you for sponsors, and then we'll come back to questions and a whole bunch of good stuff. So hold on, everybody. All right, great. So everybody can see that? Yes. Wonderful screen. So none of the work that we do would be possible without the support of the folks on the screen. So I, I want to take a moment to, to give everybody a shout out here. So our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur, Mitsubishi Electric, Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our stakeholder partner is Nicerta, and our patron sponsors are BR Plus A, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, Inatec Windows and Doors, and T Stud. So thank you very much to all the sponsors for making tonight's program possible and everything that we do at the Accelerator happen. Uh, our, our podcast is one of those things that, that the sponsors help make happen. And the current episode uh, features one of the colleagues of Adam Romano at Stephen Winter Associates, Lois Arena. So please check that out at the Passive House podcast. Tomorrow, we are joined by Killian Collins of Perkins and Will at the Global Passive House Happy Hour for a presentation about this awesome project, the, Sol the Solo Project in British Columbia. It is off-grid, uh, passive house, mass timber, low embodied carbon, really cool prototype uh, and, and stunning to look at as well. Next week at Construction Tech, we're joined by Emily Ria and Lindsay Elton of Eco Achievers, and they're gonna be talking about the red door of truth. So about blower door testing and implications for, for uh, 
for technology, technique, and technical aspects of Passive House construction and design. And then we will be joined again by Lois for a presentation about VRF systems and lessons learned in multifamily VR um, applications of VRF. There, there are some important lessons that, that Lois and her team are uncovering um, in practice, and you won't want to miss uh, the intel that she has to share at next week's happy hour. Thanks.